This is topic 2.1, Molecules to Metabolism in the IB Biology Core Curriculum. The essential idea here is that living organisms control their composition by a complex web of chemical reactions. And so what you see here on this opening slide is a diagram that is a small part of a huge chart containing nearly all the metabolic pathways of eukaryotic cells. And so when you look at this chart, what does this excerpt tell you about the complexity of the reactions that run a cell? So that's something to think about as we're talking about you know, molecules to metabolism. The understandings for this topic are listed here, they're in your study guide, as well as the applications and skills. So when we talk about you know, molecules, we have to think about it in terms of molecular biology. And one of the first um, introductions to molecular biology was when the structure of DNA was elucidated by Watson, Crick, uh, Wilkins, and Franklin in 1953. And since then, molecular biology has really done a great job of transforming our understandings of living processes. And one of the, the key tenets of molecular biology is what's called the central dogma. It's the relationship between genes and the proteins they generate, basically that information in living systems flows from DNA to RNA to proteins. And so this is a really, really important you know, idea in biology. You know, the approach that molecular biologists tend to use is what's called a reductionist approach, meaning that they take the steps of a larger pathway and break the steps down into their constituent parts. And while this is really good for understanding, you know, broader things such as cellular respiration, photosynthesis, because that's how we came to have an understanding of those two processes, you know, sometimes you have to understand that a lot of organic molecules like proteins are extraordinarily complex and they can have multiple roles in an organism. For example, melanin, you know, not only pigments the skin, but it also pigments the eyes as well and the iris. And so sometimes a reductionist approach is not always the best way to explain the role of these molecules in living systems. Something else that's really important is you to understand that carbon atoms are the backbone of every single organic molecules and that the reason why this is is that carbon is what we call tetravalent. It has four valence electrons that allow it to share uh, electrons with other atoms and form covalent bonds, which are extremely strong bonds. And the tetravalence of carbon allows for it to produce the wide variety of organic molecules that you see here. So for example, you see the largest, you know, the largest molecule in a living system called Titan, which has over 169,000 carbon atoms itself, and then um, cholesterol here, which is a large fat, and then here cellulose, which is a repeating unit of an individual glucose molecule over and over again. And then life is based on carbon compounds, including things like carbohydrates, which we'll talk more about in 2.3. But just know that carbohydrates contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, usually in a proportion of one carbon to two hydrogens to one oxygen. They are organic compounds consisting of one or more simple sugars, and um, the monomers are typically ring-shaped molecules. And so some examples of carbs that you see here are starches like glycogen and cellulose, but then you also have glucose, which is a six-carbon monomer, the most common one, and then deoxyribose and ribose sugars, which are part of nucleic acids. There are also lipids, which are also contain, you know, molecules containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It's just the proportion of hydrogen to oxygen is, you know, generally greater than two to one. These are nonpolar molecules and thus insoluble in solvents like water. And these include things like phospholipids, triglyceride fats, as the one you see here, uh, both saturated and unsaturated. We'll talk about those later. And waxes and oils and steroids. Then there are proteins, which contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Sulfur may also be a part of proteins, but they're not always a part of proteins. There's only a very few amino acids that actually contain sulfur. I believe cysteine is the only one that I'm aware of. Um, but sulfur is not in all proteins. And proteins are typically very large organic compounds made up of amino acids arranged into one or more linear chains held together by peptide bonds. And proteins have a lot of different roles in living systems. They can serve as hormones, they can serve as enzymes, they can serve as antibodies, so defense proteins, and they can serve as transport molecules such as hemoglobin that transports oxygen gas throughout the uh, plasma. Nucleic acids are the fourth class of organic molecules that you should be familiar with. These contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. 
And the monomers of these molecules are called nucleotides, and they consist of a base, a, a nitrogen base, a sugar, and usually it's going to be a five carbon sugar ribose or deoxyribose, and a phosphate group that are covalently bound together. And as it says here, you know, if the sugar is ribose, then it's RNA. And then if the sugar is deoxyribose, the DNA is the, R, is the nucleic acid that's formed. Be sure that you can identify biochemicals such as sugars, lipids, amino acids from molecular diagrams. What you see here are the amino acids, uh, three of the amino acids that you find in eukaryotes. And so you will be asked to identify what those molecules look like based on commonalities that they have in their structure. Notice that these particular molecules have a backbone that has a nitrogen, a carbon, and a carbon. Um, and then on either end, you have at the, you know, the amine end is on the left in these pictures, and the carboxyl end is on the right. And then there's always the central carbon in the center with a hydrogen atom pointing up, and then usually an R group that points down. Now that can be oriented a different way, but just understand that that R group is variable, as the R in variable is what that comes from, and those R groups can be different, which confer different properties to each amino acid. Okay, and so notice, here's your backbone, here's your R group, which is variable, and then your carboxylic acid group there to the right, your amino group there to the left. Okay, so make sure that you can identify those in a diagram if you're asked. Here are all the amino acids. Don't worry, you don't have to memorize all these, just memorize the basic structure and you should be able to identify all of these without any issue. The generalized structure for a fatty acid is going to have a nonpolar, you know, CH3 group on the end with a very long hydrocarbon chain in the middle. That's what the CH2 in parentheses N stands for because that N can be any number. And then on the other end, you've got the carboxylic acid group, and that's what makes something a fatty acid, the fact that it does have that carboxylic acid group. Okay? We will discuss saturated versus unsaturated fats in the uh, carbs, and fat, carbs and lipids presentation. And then also notice that you have sugars that have a distinct structure, you know, glucose, which is a six carbon sugar. Um, notice that you start from the very right and you start at the oxygen and you count the carbons going clockwise. If you think about it, it kind of makes an upside down question mark. That's how I always remember what glucose looks like. And then ribose is a pentose sugar or a five carbon sugar, as is deoxyribose. And again, start at the oxygen, go all the way around clockwise. Not quite a question mark, but almost. And then you can see here there are several different representations of, car of carbohydrates, glyceraldehyde, which is a three carbon sugar, and then ribose, glucose, fructose, and galactose. Notice that glucose, galactose, and fructose are all C6H12O6 sugars, but they have different structures, and this makes them what we call isomers. Remember that metabolism as a concept is the sum of all the pathways used in a particular cell. So think, do you think that all these pathways are catalyzed by the same enzymes? And so here you have, you know, just a refresher about what enzymes are. They're a class of proteins that catalyze chemical reactions. And then what a catalyst is, it's a substance that increases the rate of reaction in a chemical reaction without undergoing any permanent change itself. It's usually not, it's not used up and it's not changed. Okay. Part of metabolism includes discussion of anabolism, which is the synthesis of complex molecules from simpler molecules. So in other words, taking monomers and making them into polymers through the process of condensation. Um, and then catabolism is the opposite of that. It is the breakdown of complex molecules into simple molecules using hydrolysis. So notice condensation means water releasing and hydrolysis means water splitting. So when we talk about anabolic reactions, think building. So for example, if somebody takes an anabolic steroid, they're taking it so that they can build muscle. A catabolic reaction breaks down molecules. So for example, digestion is the best example of a catabolic reaction. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a diagram representing condensation and a diagram representing hydrolysis. Okay, and then here you go again. Notice that condensation removes a water molecule to join two monomers together to form, in this case, a dimer. And then if it happens over and over again, it's going to form a polymer. But notice on the bottom of the diagram, when a water molecule is added back in by something called a by an enzyme called a hydrolase, you're getting 
those polymers broken down to dimers broken down to monomers. And so those two processes are complementary to one another. Okay. And so here's a couple of you know more specific examples of anabolism by condensation. The formation of maltose from two molecules of glucose that forms a glycos excuse me, a glycosidic bond. And then ribosomes, which you don't see here in the picture, but where this process would take place of amino acids being formed together to produce a peptide bond. Okay, The bonds that are going to be formed, both that glycosidic bond and that peptide bond, are what we call covalent bonds. And in fact, these are what we call polar covalent bonds because they're very, very strong, very difficult to break. And then catabolism through hydrolysis would occur when, say, for example, a protease, an enzyme that is designed to break down proteins into their constituent amino acids, you know, bonds to the peptide bond and introduces a water molecule to break those peptide bonds apart so that the two amino acids can be formed um, whole again. Okay, another example would be lactase, hydrolyzing lactose into glucose and galactose by breaking that glycosidic bond. And then finally, um, one of the things that you need to understand is this, that urea is this compound that we as living organisms make. It's actually the byproduct of protein metabolism. It's produced by our liver, removed by our kidneys and our urine. Uh, but you also need to understand that that's something that can be made in the lab. You know, we as living organisms don't have exclusive, you know, right to making organic molecules and this idea back in the day of, called vitalism was this idea that living things are different than non-living ones because living things have a non-physical element or are governed by different principles than non-living things and so one of the one of the first experiments that was done to kind of disprove this idea of vitalism or to discredit this idea was when Friedrich Wohler made urea in the lab on accident and it was totally serendipitous. He was actually trying to prepare another compound called ammonium cyanate and when he prepared it he noticed that the crystals in the the glassware he was using were kind of familiar to him. He's like, wait a minute, this is not, you know, something that is just made in the lab. I've seen this in living things. He was a physician, by the way, and a chemist. And so he basically said, look, you know, I've made urea without a kidney this is actually pretty cool. And so the fact that he was able to do this in a lab discredited the idea that only living things could create organic matter. And so I think it's a really important thing for you to understand that, you know, theories and hypotheses over time do change as we collect more and more evidence, you know, to, you know, perhaps not support them as Roger Waller did. And just FYI, the information that was found in this presentation that was originally created by Chris Payne and modified by me are found at these following sources.